And take a look at these guys over here. They are train enthusiasts. This is America's newest train station. After 17 years of planning and construction, trains are now running from Philadelphia to Wawa, Pennsylvania for the first time in 37 years. But it's not just this beautiful hoagie-themed station. It's new tracks, wires, and bridges, a new crew base and rail yard, and a 600-car park and ride with direct access to US-1. There's just one problem. Um, right now we're standing in the Transit Revitalization Investment District. Uh, single family, homes only, no retail. And to get to it, you have to walk up the side of this highway, full circumnavigation, over half a mile. It's just so painfully American. But what might surprise you was that in 2006, this was the plan. A transit-oriented community featuring grocery stores, restaurants, offices, hotels, and everything else you would need on a daily basis, all within walking distance. Upon completion, it would have liberated 1,300 households from car dependency. But instead, we ended up with a place that is, well, very different. This is a story of how that happened, about how a township torn between walkability and green space ended up with neither. To put it all together, we're going on another goose chase. And this one is gonna be wild. The Wawa local is about to arrive. Set his first rail extension since 1985. Caleb, Alex, Jared, Miles are hot on the case to make a four-part series called Goose Chase. Built in 1857, Wawa was a stop on the Westchester branch until 1986, when a terrible mistake was made. With dwindling ridership and an enormous maintenance backlog, SEPTA was forced to cut back rail service 12 miles to Elwyn, one stop after Media. The idea was that Elwyn would act as a park and ride, keeping traffic out of town. But as sprawl development increased in the region, this tiny station began experiencing what transit nerds call end-of-line pressure. Look at this map. It's from a study where the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission went to train station parking lots and ran everybody's license plates while they were at work. You know, in a non-creepy kind of way. Then they mapped out where people drove in from. As you can see, there's enormous demand for the parking spots at Elwyn Station, and most of the people are driving from closer to Wawa. So in 1992, SEPTA came up with a plan to re-extend service past Elwyn back to Wawa. Then it stalled until 2000, and engineering didn't begin until 2005. But this was actually perfect timing, because in 2004, the Franklin Mint, famous for their commemorative coins, closed down. Over the course of 2005, four developers bought up all the land north of the future station, consolidating it into a single 153-acre site. So, what do you do when you have a massive piece of property that's about to gain access to a rapid transit line? Well, you do this. The proposal, officially called Middletown Main Street, featured 1,300 residential units ranging from lofts to row homes, 1.3 million square feet of retail space, 400,000 square feet of office space, and a 300-room hotel with conference facilities and a restaurant. There would also be several acres of open space along the Chester Creek floodplain. For inspiration, they pointed to new urbanist icons like Crocker Park, the Kentlands, and Mashpee Commons, as well as this nice-looking mall that one of the developers had designed. But that's not what they wanted to build. This was going to be a complete transit-oriented town. Transit access was so central to the plan, the developers were willing to contribute $51 million to the train extension, over $70 million today. The only problem was that at the time, building any of this would be illegal. Look at this archive zoning map. Most of the site is in Special Use 1, which allows a number of things, including a dairy. But what's not on this list is housing and retail, which, you know, I don't have my degree yet, but I think those are kind of important for a town to have. The only housing that could be built was in this other zone, R1. Minimum lot size, one acre. So the developers asked the township to change the zoning code, but there were some residents who didn't like this. They didn't like this so much that in fall 2006, they started a website called Save Middletown before expanding to a message board, which in those days meant things had gotten very serious. So to really hear what they have to say, I'm reading every single message. Okay, I didn't read every single message, but I read a lot. Here's a plan. Use all the money you want to put into destroying our town and defeating the hungry, giving poor children a good Christmas, or giving money to those who can't even afford their own prescription medication. And do me a favor, and I'm sure everyone would agree, stay the hell out of Middletown. These developers should all burn in hell. With all this anticipated increase in traffic, how will any of us be able to commute to and from work? I am fed up with these wealthy realtors and contractors 
like, this is really hard to read. Why did they make it in yellow? I'd say 70% of the anger was directed at the potential increase in road congestion. I find these comments frustrating because blocking the construction of walkable neighborhoods will only serve to increase vehicle mileage. This is a common theme in suburban planning, where neighborhoods are constructed to shield residents from traffic while making the problem worse. Great video about that here. People also worried about the school district, crime, and aesthetics. But the most fascinating argument was that Save Middletown was defending the rule of law itself. The most important thing is that we should not be changing our laws to accommodate developers. The developers are well aware of these laws, but assume that with their powerful clout, they can pressure or induce exemptions from council. From reading the messages, it seems like there were mainly two people in charge. First is John Laskus, a local dermatologist. It seems like he was in charge of the website as well as research. He also used to be on the township board before all of this happened. After learning about the proposal, which he called the Middletown Nuclear Destruction Plan, he personally paid for 500 yard signs printed with the phrase, No City. Then, there's Tony Iratti, who seems to be like a business IT guy. He's on the board of the Middletown Township Historical Society and said that decades ago he turned down a generous offer for running a sewer line under his property to thwart a development behind his house. In Save Middletown, he helped with yard sign distribution and wrote a lot of op-eds. I was unfortunately not able to get in touch with either of them. I mean, I could have knocked on their doors. So, were there any Yimbies on this NIMBY message board? Yeah, actually there were. Some were urbanists or libertarians or wanted the tax revenue, but most were just sick of Middletown being so boring. Some of them were accused of being developer plants, or worse, not property owners. The backlash was very effective, and within a few months, Middletown Main Street was effectively dead. In December 2006, the township voted not to change the zoning code. So over the next year, the four developers began working on a second proposal, conforming to the existing laws. It consisted of bland office blocks, light industry, and massive parking lots. I couldn't find a picture of it, but apparently it was so tasteless that Save Middletown claimed they weren't planning on building it at all, and were instead using it as a threat for if the zoning wasn't changed. It also wouldn't generate the revenue required to build the Loop Road, a piece of infrastructure promised in the original plan. But at this point, another player had come onto the scene. Remember DVRPC from earlier? They created a 63-page report titled Transitioning to T... Okay, so it wasn't a very good name, but this was no bland government document. It was a manifesto explicitly arguing for the Middletown Main Street and countering NIMBY talking points. They pointed out that some traffic might actually decrease since residents could drive way shorter trips to access amenities. They cited a recent Rutgers study which showed that transit-oriented apartment housing only generated 13 kids per 100 units. Assuming the ratio holds true, that would mean the school district would have gotten 4.2% more students in return for 17% more funding. Row homes might mean more families, but it's still probably an awesome deal. And remember, unlike low-density development, this wouldn't saddle the township with an unpayable maintenance burden. It's urban amenities with the urban density to support it. They ended the report like this. The design of this new development should be pedestrian scale and include a town center that offers a sense of place and community identity. In contrast, maintaining the site's current zoning and replacing its existing buildings with 1.5 million square feet of office space will effectively eliminate any possibility of creating a dynamic, transit-oriented place near the Wawa train station. This report sounds like something I would write. So as you can imagine, John and Tony were not very happy. In an interview with the Delco Times, Arati said, wow, did you have even one original thought? And Laska said, it's so transparent that they try to enlist a public entity to endorse their high density plan. It's DVRPC's job to push for projects that bring economic development and jobs, but not to be a shill for the developer. Save Middletown initially supported the bland office block plan, hoping to call the bluff of the developers. But after they submitted a formal proposal to the Planning Commission in 2008, some residents got worried and started to wonder if a compromise could be reached, allowing some mixed use. So the developers hired a planning consultant to hold a series of meetings with a group of community stakeholders, and by March 2009, they'd finished it. Instead of 1,300 housing units, the plan would have 980. It would have 230,000 square feet of office space, 798,000 square feet of commercial space, and a 225-room hotel. So basically, it was a scaled-down version of the original proposal, or as Lask has called it, a sugar-coated city. One of the six guiding principles the stakeholders agreed on was that there would be a direct pedestrian connection to Wawa Station. 
This was in response to the project attorney suddenly saying it wasn't possible thanks to steep terrain. We'll come back to this later. Negotiations progressed slowly over the following two years. By the way, in this time frame, Arati wrote an op-ed titled Middletown, Mint Developers Should Consider Comprehensive Plan. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let's check. Middletown's 2001 Comprehensive Plan, approved by the Township Council, says we should encourage mixed-use development along Baltimore Pike, develop a town center, and reduce auto dependence. But one decade later, in 2011, the Township Council did the exact opposite. They decided not to approve the scaled-down plan, asking the developers to come up with a fourth proposal. And lead developer Stephen Wolfson scaled this one way back. 120,000 square feet of office space, 300,000 square feet of retail buildings, and only 200 age-restricted houses. No kids. Nobody's allowed to have children in Bulgaria! Even John Laskus was happy, calling the fourth plan consistent with the community. Save Middletown endorsed it, and in January 2012, council approved the necessary zoning changes five to one. Great, so it's over. Except you know that it isn't. Soon after, developers McKee and Dambly sued Stephen Wolfson because he'd given away too much, violating their previous agreement. Wolfson Group left the project after the other developers bought him out for at least $25 million. In 2013, the remaining parties restarted negotiations with the township for a fifth proposal. Surprisingly, they were able to turn back the ratchet and get back 150 hotel rooms and 350 housing units. Families welcome. Where are all of these children coming from? I thought we had passed a law against children. Quick, this way! They called it Middletown Commons. Which sounds kind of nice, but as the plan took shape in 2015, it became very clear this wasn't going to be a place where you could live comfortably without a car. The blunt separation between uses meant commercial could be handled by Zomic Real Estate, and residential would be handled by Toll Brothers, which named the subdivision Franklin Station. This place is not transit-oriented. It's literally oriented away from the transit. But even so, the state of Pennsylvania thought it was good enough to make it a transit revitalization investment district in 2018. The grant offers $350,000 every year for 15 years. Now, some of this will help create a bike connection to Lenny, which is good. But I think we can all agree the TRID fund is not meant to subsidize more auto-based sprawl. And sprawl is what this place is, no matter how much we want to pretend otherwise. Also in the TRID application, they promised to build a staircase here and never did. Not to say they're defrauding the Pennsylvania taxpayer or anything. It's funny that after all this, Toll Brothers feels compelled to say on their website that Franklin Station is located in the famous railroad suburb of Media. This is, of course, a lie, but they're lying because they know what people want. People want to live in human settlements actually built for humans. They want something like this. I'm sitting in a part of Camden, New Jersey, known as Fairview, often called Camden's most resilient neighborhood, mixed-use zoning and a traditional development pattern has helped it survive the last century through incremental adaptation. But that's not how it was built. It was built by the U.S. government during World War I to house shipbuilders and transferred to the city only two months after construction began. I came here because of something Tony Arati told the Delco Times in 2008. He said, Personally, I think town centers are awesome, but what they proposed was a shopping destination that people happen to live in. It would seem that walkability is okay only if it's old and authentic. And sure, you can't just make another media. But that's not what doomed this project. It's also not the density or size. Many great towns started at density similar to Franklin Station. I don't even mind the bleak architecture. It's something so much more basic. It's that as a species, we've proven that we can build walkable, sustainable, and resilient strong towns over a century or a month. We've done it using governments, corporations, and through individual action. We've done it in deserts, jungles, Arctic tundra, and the ocean. Through wealth and poverty, peace and war, our ability to build human spaces has remained unbreakable. It's just that at some point, between Fairview and Franklin, the people in this one part of the world forgot how to do it. <laughs> 